Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna start quickly and by the time people will, will keep coming. So hello everyone and super happy to, to start this webinar today. Uh, so today um, I'm, I'm glad to uh, have Anna Pustelixa. Sorry about the pronunciation, but I'm super happy to have her here talking about the, all of her amazing projects. And uh, so we are going to speak about the use of augmented reality uh, in education and uh, in a particular application uh, for computational thinking. And Anna did an amazing project for Google and then uh, she did research for MIT. So I'm going to let her speak and introduce herself. And uh, if you have questions, I, I will let her know. Otherwise, you can uh, ask questions by the end. So welcome, Anna. Hello, hello. Thank you, Geraldine, for having me here. And hello, everyone that's joining. Uh, I am in Boston, um, actually. And well, Geraldine invited me to come here and talk a little bit about Hypercubes, which is an educational project that I developed while I was a research assistant at the MIT Media Lab that focuses on giving a playful introduction to computational thinking concepts in augmented reality. And Geraldine contacted me to give a brief webinar about the project and the research behind it. So I will try to explain the motivation for the work and the potential that it has as an augmented reality educational tool. And I will also introduce some other related projects that I have been working on lately. So, First of all, um, before talking about the project, uh, let me talk a little bit about my background. I am from Barcelona. I have a background in multimedia engineering and audiovisual communication. And after my studies, I moved to London and I worked there at Cinemod Studio for Dominic Harris, who is an artist. And we worked on interactive digital art. And it was very interesting to kind of be able to merge technology with the arts and, and create these immersive environments. And after London, I moved to the MIT to Boston here where I am right now. And I went to the MIT Media Lab for my master's degree in media arts and sciences. And there I developed Hypercubes, which is the project that we are going to be talking about today. And while I was at the Media Lab, I also had the chance to work at the as a creative technologist at the Google Creative Lab. And I worked there on a first concept idea that would evolve into Hypercubes later on. And I'm going to talk about it later. Um, and right now I'm living in Boston. And in Boston, I work as a principal innovation engineer for PTC, for the PTC Reality Lab. And my current work focuses on lowering the barrier of entry to complex hardware systems. Um, so that people that don't have the technical knowledge can also interact and work with these technologies at the human-computer interaction level, uh, such as robotic arms or, or uh, automated guided vehicles, like the one that you see on the slide. And I've been always very interested in trying to lower this barrier and, and create more accessibility to these technologies, uh, and also specifically with kids, so that they can learn how to navigate through the computational medium and how can it benefit their, their cognitive development as well. And so let me talk a little bit about, first of all, before I dive into the project, I want to give an introduction on the research motivation. And, and so to do that, I think the best is to talk about what I know, which is when I was a kid, I grew up surrounded by screens. You know, I have the TV, I have my mom in 386, which is, you can see me here on this slide playing with the computer. This must be 1993 or 1994. And, and you know, I, I grew up surrounded by screens. There were already a lot of screens. Um, but the interactions with all of these devices that I had were still fairly limited. And I would still prefer to spend my time on the playground with my friends, like here, I'm just playing with a ball or playing board games or doing any other activity. But we all know that in the past two decades, there's been a, a big shift in these preferences. And, and, you know, the digital offerings have expanded to insane levels. 
And, and now children have these devices and there's everything on these devices. Like they can do absolutely everything. Uh, there's such a candy store of applications and games and, and it makes sense that now kids would choose to play with the iPad than go play with a ball outside or, or play with Lego bricks, you know? Which, and, and this doesn't mean that we have to just throw all of these devices to the pile and burn them because we all know that the digital medium has an amazing uh, has amazing opportunities and it is obvious how we all benefit from it but we need to learn how to leverage both the digital medium and the physical environment for their best potential so especially when we think about education you know children need to grow up interacting with their environment with their surroundings and improving their motor skills and cognitive development and and we need to learn how to create this hybrid model that leverages both the digital medium and the flexibility that it offers and the physical medium as well. And this is where technologies such as augmented reality has a, have a lot of opportunities in, to be able to, to benefit from these, um, from these models. So one of the first things that uh, we have to consider in this digital arena, and I'm just going to give a brief overview of the research that I did at the Media Lab, and then I'm going to talk about the project. But, but one of the important things to consider is that we live, um, um, you know, we, we as humans, we have these mental models, these spatial mental models that we have ingrained in our brains. Uh, we relate to all of our actions to space since the moment that we are born. And this leads us to build a set of spatial models in our brain that govern our way of interacting with things, almost in an unconscious manner. For example, when we go out, up the stairs, we don't think about raising our leg and then moving it forward, we do that automatically. Our legs, our leg move, moves the, the appropriate distance because we have this mental model in our mind that has evolved from necessity and that has permeated in our brain until it is part of it. And we as humans, we have benefited from these fundamental spatial models to build improved interfaces. For example, one of the biggest examples is the abacus. The Abacus is a tool that we developed for practical mathematical calculations. The Abacus has a physical and spatial interface. You slide one side or the other to add or subtract. And adding and subtracting are two mathematical constructs that we found to be abstract and difficult to escalate without a physical concrete representation. So the solution to learning these difficult mathematical constructs ended up being an interface that made use of spatial models in our brain so we found a way of using our special notion of an object's position to represent and operate with this mathematical abstraction. And as I was saying, these new technologies such as augmented reality, which is basically the idea of superimposing digital, uh, digital content in our surroundings, give us the opportunity of leveraging these, these approaches. Um, Another important aspect that I think it's important and we need to take into account to considering this digital medium is how interacting with systems that use flat surfaces require new mental models that we have to infuse in our minds. We are currently creating these models without building upon the, the foundations of, this, um, of, of our intellect, basically. And that is the reason why, you know, senior people, for example, they have a hard time understanding how to use a touch screen because it is an interaction model that does not match any of their mental schemes. And children are able to adjust faster to these new interfaces as their mental models have not evolved uh, so much. But by, by offering children these flat interfaces, we inflict them an interaction frame that restricts their contact with their surroundings. And in doing this, they lose part of the proficiency of their limbs interacting physically with the environment. Uh, and it's basically, we're talking about their motor skills and, and their cognitive development, which are linked as a lot of research has, has backed up. Um, so from using their whole hands to grab a toy and move it in space, we offer them an interaction uh, model um, with just the tip of their finger to play Candy Crush Saga in a tiny screen. So, you know, again, with augmented reality, we have a big opportunity here of leveraging these both mediums and using all the flexibility of this digital medium and also like using the physical environment, using tangible interactions in order to uh, promote this 
and, and improve these motor skills, um, especially in education. So that's something that I was very interested in exploring um, as a new model of interaction. And I think we should be using more because uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, applications that are out and a lot of them don't have this in, don't take this into account. And, and you have all these like children isolated playing single user applications. And, and I think that there's a lot of improvement in that sense. Another of the things that I based my research on, it is uh, the groundwork that Seymour Papert laid uh, before us. And he was, he was a mathematician, computer scientist, and educator that worked at MIT with Jean Piaget, actually. And, and he's considered to be the founder of the con constructionist learning theory. He believed that it was very important for learners to construct these mental models to understand the world around them and put a lot of emphasis in student-centered discovery learning and project-based learning. And he was also a big advocate for the need of including computational thinking as a basic knowledge in the school, in the school curriculum. Um, and, and today, you know, the meaning of computational thinking has been a bit blurred and it has become a bit of a buzzword. But we should focus on the original meaning that Papert gave it, which is linked to the idea that computers can enhance thinking and change patterns of access to knowledge. Um, and, and this was something that I, I have always been super interested in. And when I got into the media lab, I, you know, I did all this research. I started learning more about it and getting, getting interested on it. And, and looking at all these new technologies that were coming out, I thought there was a big space here for exploration. Um, and so when I went to the Google Creative Lab, I, we came up with this concept idea of paper cubes, which was the first um, prototype that we built that would then evolve into hyper cubes. And, and we created this a quick prototype during the summer. Um, and it was basically this idea of having paper cubes that children could play with. And, and you know, it's a very easy, with, just with paper, scissors, and glue, you could just build these cubes and interact with them. And then you could do, you could use this augmented reality application and interact with different concepts in AR and you could see the content laid over these cubes, but not only visualizing this content and not only having, you know, a dancing hot dog in the table, but having more of a, more of um, the ability to change the content, to evolve, to to configure different uh, scenarios for this content, and and what this, what the opportunities that this would give the child. I thought it was pretty interesting. So I'm gonna show this video that we did at at Google when I was at the Google Creative Lab, which is paper cubes, and then we can continue. Let me play this. Hi, I'm Anna. Hello, I'm Judith. We created paper cubes, DIY augmented reality. To make yours, you just need glue, scissors, and a paper with a recognizable pattern. Cut the paper, fold it, and glue it together. You can make as many paper cubes as you want. Think of these cubes as smart building blocks for augmented reality. For example, this is the start paper cube. Once you put it next to the character one, a bunch of stick figures appear. We can make them jump. We can make them turn. We can make them stop. Or you can program more complex behaviors. This is the AI paper cube. It transfers intelligence to the stick figures and teaches them how to avoid obstacles. For example, every time they bump into an animal, tree, or reach the edge of the table, they disappear. Oops! However, over time, they get smarter and learn how to avoid the obstacles and stay alive. This is just an experiment. Imagine all of the things you could do with just paper and scissors. To see more, go to g.co slash AR experiment. So Hi, we, we, I'm Anna. Hello, we, I'm Judith. We, let me stop this. 
So this is the project that I worked on when I was at the Google Creative Lab. And, and you can see that it was this idea of starting to imbue these cubes with these um, behaviors. And so the child could play with these cubes and create different configurations. And when I did this, um, I thought this, I thought that it had a lot of potential because actually you can add any kind of behavior in these cubes and you can start creating very complex scenarios. So my idea at that point was like, this was a very quick prototype. And when we developed it, it was a bit um, hard to play with it because there was no surface tracking and, and we were, you had to see all of the cubes at the, in the same frame um, in order to track them. And if you lost the cube, there was no more interaction. So at that point, I, was, I started thinking about all, all, all the features that could be added to this application in order to make it better. And that's when I came up with Hypercubes, which is based on the same idea. And it's basically this platform for learning computational thinking by making use of a set of paper cubes to create, create and control digital content in space. And it allows for a room um, scale visual spatial experience, providing uh, the possibility for group learning and collaboration, which was very important for me. Um, because, you know, collaboration is one of the basis of, um, you know, a good education um, application. And so when I, you know, I started thinking, how could we make this bigger and how could we make, um, how could we create all these possibilities? And what, what I did is we added surface tracking, which is basically the idea of using the phone to detect the environment and detect the surfaces that you have around you. And then you, we could anchor these cubes in the surface so that there was content persistence. So when the child moved around, the content wouldn't get lost. And that opened up a whole bunch of possibilities because the kid could be like running around in the room, playing with different things in the room and interacting with all these cubes, putting them in different positions and it would make a massive difference. So that's where, that's my project. That's the project that I worked on for my master thesis. And I think I'm, let me play a video. Just before, so, uh, Anna, just before you play video, I want to mention that uh, um, it's so important when you use augmented reality uh, with kids that you don't lose the signal uh, of the marker. Because uh, yeah. for them, and, and that's super important, you don't just mention it like it, it's something uh, easy to do, but it's actually very challenging uh, for people developing app in augmented reality to make sure. Because sometimes when you use uh, AR in class, the problem is that uh, the, the kids need to adjust the, the screen. And especially when it's mobile phone, it can be tricky. And, and so that's super important that then they can focus on building uh, their computational thinking and playing with that cubes without worrying about that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's one of the things that, um, that we came across, this challenge, because paper cubes didn't have this content persistence. And you could see how the usability was really hard. It was very difficult to interact with it because you would move and everything would get lost. So by giving this solution of anchoring uh, these cubes to space, um, it would open up a lot of possibilities. And nowadays, and even more like every day, there's more technologies that are allowing us to do this. Like very recently, Apple released, uh, you know, their, these new features for uh, AR kit and the new phone that can track the environment. So when I did hypercubes, I was just detecting surfaces, but by now, we can actually detect exactly all of the different shapes that we have around in the room, and we can start having this content persistence that, that it's so important. And yes, and as Sarah Mussi is also on, on the chat on Facebook, she mentioning that it, allow for, uh, it also helps children with disabilities to easily use the cube. So it's really important because we, we now consider in class different kind of profile and, and we have different children and it's really important to have tools that uh, allow everyone to, to use it. And yes, yeah. especially for disability. Thank you, Sarah, for the comment. Yeah, 
So let me, I'm going to put the video that shows the children interacting with it, which I think it's very interesting. And then we can keep on talking about it. So you, you can you saw the app a little bit and all the features and here's a let me remove this. Here's a kid that was playing with the application and he was explaining how he did his configuration during one of the user studies. And I think it's interesting. Um, so I it has an animal goes in there and split into three sets so that it would um, the disappear go over there and fly up, um, go over here, I don't know what this is, and then just follow them, and um, go through this, get a hat, and then explode into a fire, and then keep on going. So you like he was he did this configuration with these cubes, and you can see how he started understanding, you know, the, se the sequential uh, nature of the app and what each cube does. I mean, it's, also a discovery process that there were some behaviors that he fully didn't understand but there were others that he understood very well um, and it was impressive some of the logic um, cubes i'm gonna show you now the different i think cubes also that. it's it's very nice because we we can tell he's is proud of uh, yeah. explaining everything to us he's very proud very confident and i really like that the idea that is actually building his little thing, uh, which is linked to computational thinking, and then is is very happy about showing us that, and I really yeah. like it the way yeah, the way yeah. you explain it. And that was the the one of the more most rewarding parts of the whole project was just going to the user studies and seeing how children would interact with the app and be super engaged, which was it was amazing. Did you have um, surprise regarding their reaction? I mean, obviously they were they were happy to play with it, but uh, I, was there yeah, I did some have, surprise? I had a lot of surprises, yeah, <laughs> during the user studies. Um, I think the biggest one, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, is um, 
how much they would collaborate between them. Um, they would just, you know, play together. And it was w when we went there and explained to the teachers that we were going to do this activity with these devices, they were thinking, okay, this is going to be some, you know, kids playing with a mobile phone, isolated, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And, and the, even the teachers were super surprised of the, the level of collaboration with, between the different, you know, between the children where they would play in groups, uh, you know, discuss the configuration and change the cubes in front of them. And that was super, super nice to see. Um, so let me explain a little bit about the cubes. Um, the, the application is basically based on these seven cubes and I pre-designed these. Um, when I was, you know, developing the project, but but the idea here would be that any kind of behavior can be added to this. So if we think about future projects, we could add anything here. Um, I obviously tried to. My goal was to, you know, teach computational thinking skills. So I thought about different programming constructs that I would include in each one of the cubes. So here you can see the seven cubes. And uh, you can see that there's different these programming const constructs in each one of them. So, for example, the first one is an emitter cube, and this emitter cube is the one that creates these virtual objects that will flow through space. And then you can start adding other cubes, such as the transform cube, that would let these objects move. So, the transform cube performs transformations to the virtual objects, such as translation, rotation, or scale. Uh, then there's the split cube that would separate the, the objects in different directions. There's the logic cube that presented concepts of logic gates that the students could apply. Uh, this was the hardest one and one of the ones that was more difficult to understand for the children. Um, but it's also, it was also very um, rewarding to see some of them understanding the functionality of this one. Um, and then there was the physics cube, which would allow the students to change the gravity or the mass of the virtual objects and the effects cube that where they they could create a song for example with this behavior that was a note uh, and then there was one other one that was particles there was another one that was adding a trail to the objects and finally the gaming cube which was a very important one because the they could create start generating game scenarios so they could create these checkpoints that they had to solve. It, and it gave them a, a goal. It gave them a, something to accomplish. And so they would, one of the children would use this checkpoint to specify how many virtual objects had to go through this cube and how, how these virtual ob objects had to be. If it, had, if it has to be a ball, an animal, uh, a square uh, cube, and what color this virtual object had to be, and then another another kid would come in and they would try to solve this. So they would try to select the cubes, create the configuration necessary for them to be able to uh, reach this goal that the other kid had set for them. And this changed the dynamic completely because they started playing with it um, and, and, you know, creating these game scenarios, which was very important uh, for this playful experience. Um, some other, so you can see that each one of the cubes had different behaviors on each side of the cube. So the behavior that would be the one used is the one that was on the top of the cube. So you could flip the cube in different sides and different things would happen depending on the behavior that you had in each one of the sides. Um, and then for the user interface, you can see it here. It was basically this, um, you would first turn on the app the app would have surface tracking. You would track the surface. And then when the, the cube markers appeared and the app detected the cube markers, they would be anchored in this surface so that the, there was content persistence and they would not get lost if I moved away with the app, uh, with the device. And then there was a menu on the side uh, that would have the parameters for each one of the cubes. So uh, whenever uh, they change these parameters, they would be changing the variables inside of the cube. For example, here there's the meter cube that's selected and it had different, uh, you could select how many times 
this emitter would be repeating the function of emitting an object. So you could set one, you could set several, and you could have an infinite loop. Uh, and then there was the tick interval, which was, which was how long will it take for the next virtual object to appear. And they could start tweaking all these parameters, and this would allow them to start understanding the concept of how I change a variable, and what happens, what effects does this have on the application and on the flow of these objects in space. Um, and then there was this loop cycle that was initiated with a play button in the interface, and then it would go forever until, until the student stopped uh, the, the play, basically. Um, and then whenever an object collided with a cube, such as the transfer cube, for example, the cube would light up to signal its activation. Uh, and it is very important to give all this feedback to the children. It's something that sometimes we don't think about when we build these augmented reality applications. Um, visual feedback is so important. Like we need visual feedback for everything. Um, we need to be able to convey when things happen. Every single event that goes on in the surroundings, it's very important to communicate this to the user without overwhelming them. So here you can see that when one cube was detected, there were some corners that would appear on the cube, indicating that the cube had been detected. And once the child pressed on one of the cubes on top of them, the cube would turn blue or highlight, meaning that they had that cube selected. And that's where like the parameters that they would change would apply to that cube. Um, so this is another very important thing that we find, found out. And also, the the components of the user interface you, had to be sorry very Anna, can you wait a little bit okay it's coming back it's for some seconds uh, i've seen the oh, live sorry. switch off <laughs> sorry about that can you just uh, come back to your uh, sentence right now yes so i was talking about the user interface and how it's very important to give visual feedback in order to communicate to the user the different events that happen uh, when they are interacting with the application. Um, and, and just, you know, going through the different visual feedback that I had in the app, how I would uh, communicate to the user that the cube had been detected, which is very important because in AR, a lot of the times what we do is something gets detected and we don't communicate this to the user. And then you don't know if if is it working is it not working uh, am i doing this right so it's very important that every anything that we see on the ar application we tell the user that this has been detected and that it's working um, and this is very important for usability and the user experience so um so yeah this was basically the user interface and then some of the core principles uh that i that I thought about when developing the app is basically this concept of the DIY maker culture, the learning by doing and tinkering with physical objects rather than limiting this to, to a screen with digital content and that's it. The, the child could be making these cubes. The child builds build the cubes with paper, scissors and glue and this gives the, the, the children a feeling of ownership as it's something they have built with their own hands and it's also a physical token that they can keep once they have finished using the app and that can be reused later on during a new session. Uh, so it's kind of a toy, a physical toy that they are, they are playing with. Um, another important thing is that the application is accessible to anyone without the need of having extra electronics or any other complex components. You just need paper to do this and a mobile device. Um, so it's easily deployable in any kind of environment, being in the school or being at home um, and so on and so forth. And finally, one of the principles that I presented in my master thesis, it's the concept of embodied spatial programming. There's a lot of uh, systems and platforms to teach about programming nowadays. We, we have plenty, we have Scratch, we have um, a lot of other uh, uh, applications that uh, their goal is to teach these computational thinking skills. But, um, and, and most of them provide these uh, learning environments for computational thinking, but very few make use of uh, 3D space and embodiment in their experience. And this is something very important. Um, and 
you know, the, the idea was to make full use of space and the physicality of the environment in order to enhance the learning and creation process. And so the platform introduces these abstract concepts that are embodied in a paper cube that the child can manipulate to start understanding these basic programming ideas in, its physic in their physical surroundings. And that was very important and, and some of the concepts behind the application. And so... Second, I've got a, a question, a little practical question, if you can come back to the previous slide. Regarding the cube, so you mentioned that it's uh, very nice because they can build their own uh, cube, paper cube, and then they will interact with it, so they feel that uh, uh, they are part of the process. I was wondering, because we experimented that, does the quality of paper or the way we build the cube, because sometimes, you know, when we ask them to build a cube, the cube can be not too perfect or not really well stick. Uh, does it impact the, the, the scanning uh, with the device or yeah. is it not a problem at all? Do we have to uh, teach them to build it in a certain way? It's just a yeah. practical question. Yeah, that's a very good question. And this is definitely a big challenge that I found when doing this because I had kids that went from eight years old to 14 um, and some younger ones, but the younger ones obviously didn't have the ability to build these cubes in a way where they were properly, you know, built basically. And it, it was even hard for adults also, because, you know, it's a paper cube and paper is like flicky or whatever the word is for this. So it's hard to build. So what I did, what I ended up doing is build cubes myself Definitely. Mm -hmm. and give them the opportunity. And this was totally voluntary and this was super exciting to see as well. We went there and were like, look, you have this activity that you're going to do. You can build cubes for yourself or we can give you these cubes that we're going to use for the application if you don't want to build them. So it was optional and this was very important for the activity to allow them to select whatever they wanted to do and what they felt like doing um, and, and to give them the opportunity to use cubes that we had already built um, to make sure that the application would work. So in some instances um, where the cubes were not built perfectly fine, we would have some issues with the detection. So we would be like, okay, just keep this for yourself and you can use this other one. Uh, to have the experience in the application. And yeah, this was definitely a challenge. And of course, um, it's something that, you know, it's better if the children maybe, if they have problems building these cubes, have someone to support definitely. them and help. We, we had um, a little uh, Gogi lab, which was in a, you know, a workshop with kids from different ages. And we used Paperclip as well. And as you say, we, we had uh, another solution, which were because we in the group, uh, we had children from different ages and spontaneously some of them say, oh, I don't like to, to make cubes and older one or some, some, some who are really more talented for that, more skilled for that would, would just do it for them. And naturally, uh, actually children would help each other already at this point because the older one would be happy to make the cube for the, the younger one. And then the other will be uh, more skilled for the use of, uh, you know, the tablets. Then we we'll help each other. And this happened very naturally. I didn't have to tell them, oh, look, uh, you, uh, you should help uh, you and, and so on. So this is something I really, I was really impressed when I, when we did the, yeah. this workshop. So yes. Yeah. So if you have a class and you have different uh, children with different ages, or if you can make cube already. So this is uh, an amazing yeah. solution. Uh, Definitely, yeah. But also like one of the things that I was super surprised and I was very excited too was the fact that uh, there were kids that they were more interested in building cubes than using the app and they would just want to have the full set and it was kind of a collection thing. They, they were like trying to make as many cubes as they could to have this collection of cubes for themselves. And they were just so excited about building the cubes and they didn't even care. I mean, this was a, a small set, but they would just be building cubes and cubes and cubes and cubes. <laughs> and it was just super funny to see 
uh, this this need of like wanting to collect, no, that it's also very present in games, and and so that was funny too. Um, but yeah, super exciting. Um, and so finally, yeah, just wanted to go through some of the um, the user studies that I did. Um, I, they were qualitative user studies. Um, I did two pilot studies, one in the UK and one in Somerville here in Massachusetts. And I did one more like final qualitative user study at the MIT Museum in Cambridge. Uh, and the, the most important thing is that these were not quantitative user studies. So I cannot claim that, you know, this tool is, um, it's going to give good learning outcomes for computational thinking. These were qualitative user studies that would assess engagement and, and, and you know, how I had researcher notes and I did some service to the teachers, but definitely there's a, a lot more work to do in this front where we would need quantitative data in order to compare this augmented reality application to some more traditional uh, programming, learning programming tool. Um, and that's very important to say, because, um, you know, I don't want to be claiming that um, I had these results. Um, but, but I think that the, just by the qualitative user studies, it's very interesting to see uh, some of the outcomes that came from them. And, you know, I was excited to see, for example, the duration of play was pretty long. People, like kids were, were super engaged with the application and this was voluntary. They could stop playing whenever they wanted and they kept on playing and playing and that was exciting to see the complexity they would create configurations with two cubes or to ten cubes for example and that was also exciting and and they would just keep on adding and adding and adding which was uh very nice to see as well as i said before the collaboration between students was pretty amazing um, and, and we were all, I think we were all very surprised, me and, and the teachers as well, how they would play together in groups and, and you know, discuss. And it was nice to see them because there was a conversation going where they would be like, no, just use this one because then it, this is going to happen. And the other one was like, no, no, why don't we use this one? And then this other thing is going to happen. And they would just place them and have a discussion around it. And that was very nice to see as well. Um, we did um, an iterative design where we did these pilot studies and then from the feedback of these pilot studies, I improved some uh, parts of the application, for example, making the elements of, on the user interface bigger. And this is a very important thing too. When we develop augmented, when we develop augmented reality applications, we need to understand that it's hard to be holding the phone and at the same time interacting with the screen and at the same time tracking things. So this is something that we um, give for, you know, we, we think that it's easy, but, but it's actually a, a challenge in, in usability and in user experience. Um, and we need to make sure that these elements in the user interface are big enough so that especially children, uh, they have an easy access to these elements and they can select these components easily. And at the beginning, when I developed the app, these components for me were too small and children were having a hard time to press on them and at the same time track the cubes and at the same time move in the space. So there are so many components that you need to take into account that you want to make this user interface as easy to interact with as possible. And that's why it's important to make them big. Not big enough that it's covering the entire screen because you want to let the AR show, but you know, maybe just hiding and showing what's important at each moment in time. Um, the use of space, uh, that was exciting to see as well, because they were playing in the entire room. They would place the cubes all around, uh, just stack them together, one on top of the other, put them you know, in different configurations, play with other toys, and place them on top of other toys. Uh, and then finally, on the computational thinking part, you could see and a lot of the, the studies were exciting because a lot of kids, you could start seeing how they would understand the sequencing nature of the application and how if they swap the cubes one in front of the other, the, the things would change, the, the events would change on this flow of objects. Um, and they were able to project to the future. They were able to think, okay, if I put this configuration in the space, this is going to happen. 
um, how do I do this to get to this thing? They, they wanted maybe a virtual object to get to a wall and they were like trying to make this configuration so that it happened. So it was nice to see this projecting to the future. Um, and, and all these results I ended up publishing at uh, Kai Play last year uh, as a late breaking work. Um, and that's the that's where where the project arrived and that's the basically what I ended up doing. And I unfortunately the application is not available and I would love it to be. I'm working on it and hopefully we can release it soon. Um, but for now, uh, this is what uh, the, I have the application built. I just need to go through some stuff and uh, publish it in the App Store and give the the cube pattern so that people can start playing so, with it. And uh, regarding your uh, availability, um, I've got a question from Sarah. She said, is there a possibility in the future to maybe use uh, Web AR for this experience? Because uh, apps are great, but it's difficult to convince schools and families to install new app at this point. So it is, a, is there a possibility for, for web AR application? Yeah, I mean, web AR, yeah, definitely. And this is something that it's going to get more pervasive. Um, right now, I think it's harder because web AR is not so, um, you know, advanced in the sense of like, um, accessibility and, and easy ease of use uh, as other tools such as Unity, where you can very quickly create these applications. But definitely we are going to, we are moving forward. And, and I think this is going to end up being that you can just open up the browser and be able to use this without the need of downloading any application, uh, which is what should be happening soon. Um, would it be some, think, some constraint, technical constraint, if you would like to adapt? And uh, maybe we, we can share that to explain that when you want to adapt um, something that has been created for an app application and you want to adapt to web more kind of environment, uh, there are constraint, technical constraints, for instance. I know that this, the size of the 3D objects, um, you know, are because we don't want that it's going to load for hours, or we don't want that all the work on the in user interface uh, is, is changed uh, or it has to be even simpler. So can you mention eventually a few, few constraints to explain that, yes, we, we all want to go that direction, but then technically sometimes it's challenging. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I haven't, you know, I haven't used web AR. Um, I have been all, all working with Unity, and and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the project that we are developing right now, which is kind of a mix between the two, but it still needs an application. But uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, you know when you're using Unity, you have all these libraries for scanning the space, and you can do that easily with the devices, and that's something that when you are creating an application, um, it's way easier. Than, than doing this for web, because web it's just not there yet in the sense of creating this augmented reality experience. And you can build stuff already, and, and, and it's exciting to see, but um, there's a lot of uh, things that still need to get there in the sense of you know um, detecting the environment and, and detecting markers. And, and it's something that I think it's slowly getting there, but uh, we just need to um, maybe wait a little bit more. Well, anyway, she, Sarah says it's a uh, it's fantastic project I had an idea, so congratulations for that. We're Thank running you. a little bit of time. In case the um, Zoom uh, cuts uh, us down, uh, I will reload um, another session. So don't worry uh, for people who are following us uh, via Facebook. Uh, I will launch another session. Is that okay for you, Anna? So have the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It That's should fine. be okay, but sometimes Zoom, you know, it's like cuts off. <laughs> Very no strong. <strange. problem. laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. So, so we'll just, I mean, honestly, like, I just want to, I was just going to talk about a little bit what I'm working on now, because I think that it's exciting too, and I think it can be very beneficial as well if we are thinking about educational platforms in augmented reality. Um, Nice. One of the one of the projects that I have I developed at the Google Creative Lab was Invisible Highway, and I want to show it because it helps me explain a little bit what I'm going to explain next. 
Uh, and let me play the video. This is a very quick video, actually. Um, we created this tool to be able to plan the path of this robot in AR. <laughs> I mean, this is super cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, this was very fun. Um, this this is the project Invisible Highway, and the idea was to be able to, you know, drive this robot in augmented reality. And it's an idea that it just makes sense directly in the sense of spatial computing. You have this robot, and how you can drive them in space. You can just use augmented reality as an interface to create this path and then add anything that's digital on top of it. <laughs> and and this was a tiny prototype that we developed at the Creative Lab. But now that I'm working at the world at the Google no, at PTC, at the PTC Reality Lab, um, we have been working on a new project that we have released this year, which is the Wolfuria Special Toolbox. And let me show you another video quickly, which is this platform for exploring spatial computing. And here you can see that I have this Lego boost robot. And what I'm doing is doing path planning for the boost. And this little robot, this is my living room, um, can move through this path. And I'm using this, uh, this application, this platform called the Buforia Spatial Toolbox in order to design this path for the robot to follow. Um, and here you can see one, well, it just follows the path. But, you, but this tool, it's a, it's a tool that has been developed for a lot of years, actually. Uh, and we just open sourced it. Um, so it's available right now. Like you can develop the app um, right away. It's the Buforia Special Toolbox. So PTC, it's my company, and PTC owns Buforia. Um, you, some of you may know Buforia is the library um, for uh, doing augmented reality and detecting um, the space. and and one of the projects that we have worked on is this Buforia Spatial Toolbox, as this is a research platform for exploring spatial computing. And I will share the link by the end because we had some questions. And uh, I will probably uh, add the link uh, at the bottom of uh, the article I write about you on the website. So Perfect. you'll be able to, to uh, re-watch all the videos and, uh, and, and check in details what uh, you guys are doing at PTC Lab. and. and Yes. All the mail. Feel, feel free to check as well uh, what they are doing because uh, lots of very interesting projects, uh, even uh, maybe not always related to education, but then uh, can give also a great idea of the huge potential we can have when we link uh, special, special computing uh, and, and this kind of. Uh, this kind of very cool application. You have a lot of congratulations uh, in the audience. Oh. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> found the project super cool. And I even know some adults uh, would love to test this, this app that looks very fun. <laughs> so, awesome. Great. That's great. So I'm going to take some questions and, and um, ask to Anna. So if you guys have some questions, feel free to, to write it down. Thank so, you very much. <laughs> thank you. Me. Thank you so much, Anna. I, I really love your work and, and all the amazing things that you are doing. But uh, I think it's a shame that it's not uh, well known enough, I think. And <laughs> the first time I see your video, I was like, I have to talk to you. And uh, please let me do an article. Let me invite you to a webinar because everyone needs to know about your work and uh, all the amazing things you are doing for uh, also the work on the inter interface for, for children. Uh, okay, so uh, awesome, congratulations. This is super cool, amazing project, it's fabulous. I really uh, loved it. Uh, 
So awesome. I'm going to start with some question and then uh, I will take uh, the question from the audience later on. Um, so first you mentioned collaboration that will happen uh, naturally uh, and you were very happy about that. And I think collaboration is the key point when we want to introduce immersive technology. Uh, and, and in general, in class, we are looking for, for collaboration skills to, to be uh, developed. So do you think is it the, the collaboration when you, you notice when you were uh, testing hypercubes, what it, would it be, uh, was it due to the use of AR? because they had these tools and they were having fun or was it use uh was it was it were does the collaboration uh was due to the the cubes and the fact they were working on computational thinking i don't I know if i'm if i'm clear enough <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, that's yeah. yeah. In English. i think the the thing the point here is um the collaboration happened because we were taking out the content of the screen like the 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 activity was not in the screen the activity was in front of them with these toys that they had in their environment and they all had access to these toys and if you think about one kid playing right normally there was one that one kid that was controlling the device but all of the other kids around, they could play with the different cubes and just place the cubes and move the cubes around. And that's what created this um, kind of, you know, collaborative experience where they were just trying to put the, and, and one, when one kid tried to put, place a cube in the, cor in the configuration that they had, it, they, he act, or she actually like immediately checked on the phone and tried to tell the other one, you know, press on this cube that I just added and let's see what happens if we change this parameter. And that oh, was okay. really interesting to see because, you know, it was, and I think this happens when you take the content out of the screen, like we have the screen, right? But then we have this extension in AR, which is we are actually playing with our environment and our surroundings. And what happens when, when we have a scenario like this? Um, and I think we need to take advantage of this because it's super interesting and, and very beneficial. Yes, exactly. But you mentioned at the beginning that the the flat screen interaction is is very uh, kind of low, and and the potential of augmented reality is that because at home or maybe in other uh, circumstances, kids are used to be alone with their screen or to have to stop to show to other child, and and with this uh, project, they can actually uh, discover a new way, and I think it is more natural for them to actually uh, collaborate because they okay. like to play with each other. And it's very frustrating to have a tablet, play a very cool app and to have to wait for uh, that you're finishing your, your experiments to, and, and then to let the other play. And in this kind of uh, dual uh, kind of uh, experience, then you have the paper cube and then you have this uh, devices like mobile phone or tablet then you can play with all the in interfaces. And, and I think this is very interesting to encourage this for, for collaboration. And regarding teachers, like um, how, how do they, what are their role uh, when you use this, uh, these tools with uh, Hypercubes? I guess you were also here during uh, the use, of, or during the whole project, but how the teacher react, what, the, what were the role they wanted to play and do you think it would be uh, feasible for a teacher alone to uh, animate uh, and to lead uh, a course with, with this tool? What do you think about the, the role of the teacher? Yeah, I think um, the one, like when I was at the at UK and I went to the Leicester AI Festival, we had the, the children from this uh, Sunsfield Close School um, and, and they came, like the teachers came along and the, teacher were, the teachers were also playing with the app, which was really funny. Uh, and they were also involved in the whole activity. So it was basically, it was kind of a workshop. And, and you know, we were there helping, the, giving support to the children, helping them build the cubes. And the teachers were also involved in the, in the activity in the sense of that they were 
actually very impressed and they were like trying to do the configurations themselves as well. Um, and one of the, you know, I gave them this service that they have to respond at the end of the study and, and all of the feedback was super positive. And also, they also mentioned that it was super cool because they could see these being used for many other topics on the K-12 curriculum. Like, you can actually uh, think about a lot of other subjects like, you know, physics or mathematics or um, I don't, I don't know, stories. You can like have history and like in these cubes and like do this in the space and, and see a story happening. So they saw the potential that it could have, um, you know, in the future as an app that has all this content in it. And that was exciting too. And but, regarding but, the sorry, just go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, regarding the cubes, you mentioned that um, on each phase uh, you have different potential action um, or, or patterns. Um, does um, how the kids uh, like react to the cubes? Would they ask for something else? Would they happy? Uh, were they happy with the actual uh, possibilities? Yeah. Uh, I guess they were wondering uh, how to create cubes and marker so what yeah is, so what the one of the, regarding that one of the challenges that i saw with the cubes that i have um is that they have icons to represent these programming constructs and the kids at the beginning when they started playing with the cubes there were some behaviors that were harder to understand and some of the teachers uh, in the survey forms, they, they told me that it may be better to include words to indicate what these behaviors are, which could be better. I haven't tried, and, and it's something that it's a feature that could be added in these cubes. I just didn't want to overload these cubes with you know words and things. So I just wanted to have this simple design with these icons that would represent the behaviors. But it's true that if we think about an educational setting, um, it may make sense to add more uh, hints on what the cubes and the behaviors do. Um, and this is something that uh, I saw when I was doing the pilot studies as well, and it could be added in the future. And for the content in the cubes, I think they were just exploring what they, they saw in there, and, and they were just trying the different cubes and but I'm pretty sure one of the future things that I wanted to do was be able to allow the kids to draw their own behaviors and just create themselves whatever they wanted in that phase of the cube and have like, you know, allow them to create these behaviors by themselves instead of like having this pre-designed mm -hmm, um, set of cubes, which would be amazing. But and obviously, it will open the, the like, big potential for teacher to uh, you know, integrate uh, the, these cubes to their lesson, to their curriculum, like needs. Yeah. I think it's very interesting what you mentioned between the, the word or assemble. It will also depend of the, uh, the age of the child. Yeah. Uh, I think for a younger child, it's better not to overload it, the cube and, and keep it simple, even though we, we like uh, uh, remove some logic cubes and keep it very yeah. simple. And then for all the one to give them the possibility to, to go for more complex uh, like yeah. building. Yeah, and, and you could also like use it as, you know, semantic relationships and starting to teach language, for example, you know, when, with these behaviors and this digital content, which would be also a possibility. I think that's super interesting. Uh, thank you so much for uh, everything and presenting your work. Maybe we're going to... Um, tell again that uh, all these applications will be shared and you'll have the links and uh, i think the development of the app uh, will be uh, for next year so you'll be able to use it uh, probably next year and if you have questions you can uh, ask us um, directly or you can uh, write an email to anna i'm sure she'll be happy to answer and if you like uh, to know more about augmented reality and virtual reality in general, you can visit our website. So we are trying to ease the use of uh, this technology um, for teachers and also parents of homeschoolers. 
So if you'd like to know more about different application and we can have in augmented reality, but also in virtual reality and the challenges we have in class, so feel free to visit the website. And so just so to announce, if you're interested, uh, we'll, our next webinar will be about uh, virtual reality. And we will talk about the, like, uh, the safety uh, of uh, the use of virtual reality for children and what we need to take care of, what we need to be aware, uh, how to use it, for what age and, and so on. So I'll try to tell you a little bit more about that. And, so uh, I will release the date <laughs> pretty soon. So thank you so much Anna for your time, for sharing everything and you guys, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. Uh, thank you, Paula, for coming. And Joe, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, uh, Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everyone, Teresa. It was great and I'm super happy and hopefully uh, we will uh, hear a, a lot about your, all your projects. So please keep doing some super fun projects. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.